Is this is this on? Because I ain't much of a beginner. Can y'all hear me good? Okay. Man, it's hotter than a pawn shop chainsaw out there. Nobody got that joke. <laughs> Either that or your chainsaw's been stolen, you don't think it's funny. <laughs> One of the two. But it's so good to be here. Brother Tony Esther to speak a few weeks ago, and I completely ignored him. On purpose. Amen. <laughs> I didn't have nothing to say. That's honest truth. I mean, you can always say something, right? But I didn't have anything on my heart. So I just ignored him for a couple of days, and it wasn't uh, about two days of ignoring him. Brother Latham up at the Free Will Baptist asked if me and Jess could come and, and play and sing. So that gave me a good excuse not to come here. I did have no intentions of ever coming here. I've spoke here once before. I have no intentions whatsoever of ever coming and speaking here again or anywhere else for that fact. But the Lord uh, opened my eyes the other day, and I got to witness some stuff, be a part of some stuff that uh, I just feel like i got to get out. If any of y'all that do know me, and I think most of y'all do, I'm a fairly reserved type guy. I keep my feelings and my thoughts and stuff lots of times what was the same close to the sleeve. But when I have something to say, I feel like I need to say it. And I feel like the Lord has gave me something to say. Now, before I got here, I was extremely nervous. And I don't know that nervous is the right word, it's anxious. And my wife asked me, she said, you have to calm down. What you so amped up about? I said, because I'm going to war. Right? I'm not going to war with y'all. There ain't nobody in here I'm going to war with. Amen. How many of y'all in there has ever been in a fist fight? <laughs> if anybody in here before getting a fist fight, did you not get a little, did your heart not get to pumping? Did you not get adrenaline going? Did you not get that sense, you know? I'm going to war. Right? I'm going to war right now with Satan. Uh, and so therefore, I got a little lamped up. And guess what? I kind of like it. There's a sense of me that's like, man, calm down. But there's a sense of me that says, no, let's get it on. Let's run. Right? As a matter of fact, my wife addressed me a while ago. She said, uh, you need to button your sleeves. It looks so good. But you can't fight with your sleeves pulled out. So I'm going to roll them up because <laughs> we're about to fight, right? Uh, before I get started, though, I'd like to say it's so good to see all y'all here. It's so good to see uh, Cagglesville Church show up on a Sunday night like this. Uh, I feel like I know, well, I guess I do know pretty much all of y'all, and it's been a blessing to have y'all in my life, but maybe even more so, I don't know if I should say more so, but even as much so, it's such a blessing to have those who normally don't come to church here or anywhere come out here tonight. Uh, I count you as my true friends. Lynn, I ain't seen you. How long has it been since we've seen each other? It's been a long time. It's so good to see you. Uh, it's good, so good to see you back there. I'd also like to thank my brother, uh, my Gideon brother, uh, Brother Bob Jones, uh, for being here. And we're going to get into that in just a little bit. Can I call you Sister Mimi? You sure can. <laughs> <laughs> That's Sister Reed, right? Reed. Sister Reed, it's so good to see you here. And I know today's got to be a special day because you got two of your grandkids right. at church with you at the same time. And I know that's a blessing. Blake. Thanks for coming, buddy. I appreciate it very much. Um, but anyhow, it's just a blessing. I want you all to know before I get started as well that I'm not here for any reason but to further the kingdom of God. That is it. That is it. You all that know me know I don't normally dress like this. This is not my style per se. But what this is for me uh, here lately, I have felt maybe a need or I understand a doctrine, I guess you could say, of uh, this is a formal setting, and we're discussing the Lord during this formal setting, so I wear my best that I have. My wife went and bought me. I didn't have any nice clothes, uh, dress clothes. My wife went and bought me some a couple of weeks ago, uh, and I felt it pressed upon my heart that on the Lord's Day, and I get to stand in some sort of formal setting that, such as this, the Lord surely gave me his best, so I want to give him my best. But do not think that to those of y'all that normally see me either in overalls covered in grease and diesel fuel or shorts and covered in catfish lime and cut bait, that I'm trying to stand up here and be anything that I'm not. 
this is just one form of worship that I have to give my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and that is it. I promise you, I'm not nothing in here that I'm not outside, right? My, everything that's good in me that is Christ, that's with me in here, is with me out there, and everything that's bad in, in me and myself, unfortunately, I have a tendency to bring it in here with me, right? So I'm not anything that is not, I'm not trying to be something I'm not. All right, now, let's get on to some scripture and stuff. Let me ask y'all a question. First of all, it's good to see you. I was nervous because you weren't going to be here. I don't know why I was so nervous. I guess I'm because I know you was going to amen and shake your head and, and, and keep me encouraged when nobody else in here is. Because <laughs> this is a pretty quiet crowd, right? So, are y'all still in the Navy C. Cook? So, for those of y'all that were here for uh, Sun School this morning, this is not new news. Guess what we're going to talk about? We're going to talk about salvation. Now, this is going to be basically. I'm not going to call this a sermon because I'm not a preacher. I've uh, never had to call him to preach, but I have something on my heart to share. Tony always offers up the pulpit for me at this time. But this is going to be a two-part speaking engagement, I guess we'll call it. Uh, one part is for the church. And when I say the church, I don't mean this church specifically. I mean for everybody in here, in here who has accepted Christ. Uh, and... and Count him as their Lord and Savior. The other part's going to be for those of y'all, if there's any in here who haven't accepted Christ. So we're going to have this little two-part deal, right? And we're going to talk about my experience that I had uh, was it two weeks ago, Brother Bob. We're going to talk about that and how it applies to all of us and, and exactly what everything means. So if y'all brought your Bibles, and if you didn't, that's fine. Y'all ever seen me in glasses? Reach the age. <laughs> Reach the age. Some of y'all are laughing because it ain't happened to you, and some of y'all are laughing because y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Romans 10, 14 and 15. We're going to start off right there. Romans 10, uh, verses 14 and 15. If you're there, say amen. Okay. Romans 10, 14 and 15. Uh, it says, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? Now we're talking about we're talking about Jesus, okay? And this who this is ref referring to is Jesus. It says, but how can they call on him, Jesus, to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go to tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, How beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. Let's go with prayer. Father, I come to you this evening and just thanking you in the mighty name of Jesus, Father, for salvation that was brought to us, Father, for giving us the opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus Christ, Father. There's so many in this world that haven't heard the good news. And Father, though I don't understand how somebody cannot hear it and still go to hell, Father, that is not my place to try to play God, Father. All in my place is, is to be obedient and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I thank you for those that have come here tonight. I especially thank uh, those of my friends that uh, don't normally come uh, here uh, from my home church or my other friends, Father. I just thank you for them being here tonight, Father. Most of all, we thank you for being here tonight, being in our hearts. In the mighty name of Jesus and all the church say it. Amen. All right. So Paul says, how in the world is anybody going to hear about Jesus? And how is anybody going to get saved if nobody tells them about it, right? Let me tell you something. Since I got saved, uh, since I gave my heart to the Lord, since I accepted him as my personal Savior, as my Lord, which means I no longer get to do what I want to do all the time, I'm subject to him, right? Uh, ever since I accepted Christ, I've had two burdens in my spiritual walk. I don't know if that burdens is not the, the, the right word. Two desires. One, huh, this one is a tough one. One is to know that the, the perfect doctor, all right, because we've got this denomination, that denomination, this denomination, that denomination, and I don't know that any of them have got it right, but I do believe that God really intended there to be a perfect doctrine written within the canon of scriptures. Uh, Thank God for grace and mercy that he don't wipe us all out when we don't get it. But 
you know, I, I understand that I, you know, I hear some pastors or some doctors say this, and I'm like, well, that kind of makes sense, and they got the scripture, and then I, I hear another uh, another pastor that believes differently, you know, say why he does and with the scripture, and that makes sense, and lots of times I'm left in the middle going, I don't know, you know, he makes sense, he makes sense, this don't make sense, you know, so anyhow, I'm still working on that. Uh, I definitely do not have the perfect doctor. As a matter of fact, I have a lot more questions than I have answers right now. But the second desire, or maybe I should say the first desire that God has instilled in my heart is sharing the gospel. And uh, God gave me that opportunity a few weeks ago. It's actually been a little longer than that by joining the Gideons. Does anybody know, or is there anybody here that doesn't know who the Gideons are or what they do? Just in case you don't know, and Brother Bob can clarify this after service if I mess it up. But the Gideons International is basically a group of men who have come together and is for basically the collection and distribution of Bibles so the gospel gets spread out into the world, right? Jesus gave the Great Commission. The Great Commission, go ye therefore into all nations preaching the gospel and baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, lots of times I don't have the ability to go to Africa, right? I don't have the means. I got a six-year-old. My wife works out of town. I got a job. I stuff. But this gives me the opportunity to do my part, to do one small call in this big wheel that's, that, that's the gospel ship, if that's what you want to call it, to do my part. I felt a big present on my heart to become a Gideon. Uh, the Lord has made me comfortable. I used to not be, but he's made me comfortable through uh public speaking, or with public speaking through teaching Sunday school at my church, and used to, me and my wife didn't have two nickels to rub together, we had to eat beans, and as part of the Gideons is everything is funded by yourself. And now that she has graduated college, I'm not telling you we're rich, I'm not telling you we're rolling in it, I'm just telling you I finally have gas money. For years we didn't have gas money, but I'm telling you now, I finally have some gas money where I can drive to this church or that church or whatever it need be. And I also can trust that God's going to provide if we come up a little short. But so with the public speaking and just finally getting out of college, getting a job and this and that, I felt like uh, I, I kind of felt like the, the parable in the Bible where it says that this master gave three people, these three men, these talents, and talents back then, uh, is also translated as money. And one buried his, the other one made a little money off of his, and the other one invested it and made a lot of money, and he called the one that didn't do anything with his, he called him evil and wicked. And I felt like since God gave me the comfortableness, finally, of public speaking, and finally gave me and my wife some means, um, I was afraid that if I died and I stood before God, he's going to say, what would you do with the talents I gave you? And I sure didn't want to say I wasted them. Gideon's has always been on my heart, so I gave you the opportunity uh, to join it, to join the Gideon's, become a Gideon, and I'm so thankful. So that's why I joined the Gideon's, was so I could share the gospel of Christ. If I couldn't actually verbalize to everybody in the world, at least I could be part of some organization that makes sure that the gospel is distributed across the world. Does that make sense? Okay, so... We go to, me and Jess go to our first, and she got to join the ladies' auxiliary, the Gideon's ladies' auxiliary. So we go to our first meeting the other night. It's probably been a month ago, I believe. And Brother Bob was there, and a whole bunch of Gideons were there, and we got to hear some great testimonies about a man that uh, went to Africa and all kinds of stuff. And, uh, me and Jess knew that we was in the right place. When you know, One thing about the Gideons that I love is they pray. They pray. A buddy of mine was in the Marines, and I know it's one thing the Marines do, before they do anything, they have formation. And after they're done, they have formation. And that's kind of the same as the Gideon. Before they do anything, they have prayer. And after they do anything, they have prayer, which is a wonderful thing. But we go and we have us a wonderful time. And we're walking out. And Brother Bob comes up and introduces himself to me. And, and we're talking. And he said, do you like to share the gospel? And I said, yeah. You know, and I was like, duh, that's why I joined. Because I want to distribute the gospel across the world. Do my part, right? He said, okay. And I was thinking really that I was going to be going to churches and, and doing this kind of speaking stuff. You know, and saying, hey, we're the Gideons. This is what we're about. Would you like to make a donation? All the 100% of the proceeds go to the Bible. 
And I thought I'd be going to Hector School, Pottsville School, wherever, handing out Bibles to kids, maybe the hospital, hotels, whatever, handing out Bibles. I thought that was that was it. And he said, so you like to really share the gospel? I was like, yeah, that's why I'm here. I love you. He said, cool, give me your name, social security number, date of birth, get the clearance, we're going to prison. And we're going to hand out Bibles and evangelize. So right, that's cool, I guess. <laughs> you know, you can't say you love to share the gospel and then not take the opportunity. Me and my wife was talking about this this morning. Well, I'm going to get it for this one. She is telling me this morning how she loved to walk. I said, you don't love to walk. If you love to walk, you would be walking. You know, I said, we, we find time to make time for what we love to do. I love to catfish, so guess what I do? I find time to catfish, right? So if I love the gospel, and if I love sharing the gospel, then I find time to share the gospel, correct? So I said, all right, man, let's get it on. He's like, it's going to be cool. We're going to Malvern. That's intake, what used to be known as diagnostic. Uh, the diagnostic was somewhere else at the time. But he said, man, he said, that's where we go in. He said, and it's intake. He said, everybody that's going to prison goes to this one prison, and that's where they do their dental records and their physicals and health checkups and this and that. And he said, and that's where they decide exactly which prison they're going to. He said, it's real cool because you can catch them, like in between the dentist and the eye doctor or whatever. He said, you actually get a one-on-one -on -one chance to just sit there and talk with them. And he said, them people are desperate because they're headed off to prison, maybe for the first time, maybe for the third time. They've hit rock bottom. Great time to share the gospel. I said, all right, man, let's get it on. Right, I'm ready to fight. Right, I'm ready to fight the devil. So let's get it on. So I give him my info. He comes back and he says, all right, you're in. So, okay. Little did I know, though, intake was not where we was headed. He said, we're headed to Tucker. I'm mind, I'm like, okay, whatever. One, one penitentiary is the same as the other to me. One jailbird is the same as another jailbird, right? I don't mean that in disrespect. But y'all know what I'm talking about. A lost soul is a lost soul, is what I'm getting at. So we we all load up, and he tells me, he said, all right, be prayed up, and don't be late. We're leaving now. Six, six o'clock, I think it was, whatever time it was, we're meeting here, and we're loading up. All right, so I, I load up, or I, I get there, I like, Pray for the three days that I have, you know, should have fasted. I didn't even think about fasting, but I, I probably should have fasted, but I, I was in prayer. I was in prayer for me. I was in prayer for the ones I was going to come in contact with. We get down there, or we meet up, all right? Now, let me, let me say this. When I get there, there's four other men. I don't mean this offensive, Brother Bob, but if y'all will look at Brother Bob, he was probably the biggest, meanest looking one there. <laughs> I don't know if y'all know this or not, but if you met him in a dark alley, you probably wouldn't be worried. So imagine what the other ones look like. Hey, I praise God for one, but <laughs> one's kind of old, not in good health. Looks like he's got one foot in the grave, other than on a banana peel. The other one's built like a toothpick. He's tall, but he's slender. The other one, bless his heart, and I love these men. But he looked like you ought to have a pocket protector on and punching on the computer. You know, not what I'm getting at. It's not, hey, and I fit in with these men. Right? I mean, there's nothing about me that's like, ooh, I ain't man of God. No, dude. You know, I, I don't have that physical appearance to me either. So we load up in this van. We head on down there, and it's pretty quiet on the way down. We pull in there, we pull in in a van, and I'm thinking, boy, I bet there's been a lot of fellas pulling down here in a van before. They're not as happy about coming here as what these men are. You know, and there's a little hesitation to me, a little bit of reservation to me, you know, the fear of not going. I've never been there before. So we go in, take the belt off, the shoes off, all the metal out your pockets, you go to the metal detector, you get uh, pat down, check your feet, and this and that, and finally we go on through. So then we go on through, and the very first person we see, we get out of one building, walking across, I guess they call it the courtyard. Every time you walk out, the door opens, the door shuts, sidewalks, uh, chain link, bar bar, the whole prison works, right? And the very first person we see is the chaplain's assistant. He is an inmate, been in for 40 years. So Bob, if you say he's 6'10, say 400 pounds, and where's the size? 450. 
wears a size 20 shoe. Big Mike. Big Mike. We don't call him Little Mike. I promise you that. In fact, I call him Sir. That man shook my hand and swallowed my hand. Y'all ever shook a man's hand and your hand just disappears? You know what I'm talking about? Man made Buddy Bear Thoughtman look like a thief. I'm telling you, a mountain of a man. First person we see, so we go over to the chapel. That's where we store the Bibles at. Come to find out, we don't take no Bibles down with us. And I thought, that's where we're getting, where all our Bibles at. What they do is they ship them down prior. That way the the uh, security can go through and investigate, check, and look for contraband. If we took them down with us, we'd spend our whole time there letting them go through the Bibles, make sure we ain't smoking any dope or anything else. So we go in there and we go to this nice chapel. This chapel's nicer than my church, nicer than Rome Springs, the building was. Come find out all the money. Uh, it took to build that was donated by Johnny Cash. That's pretty cool. So we go in there and we get the Bibles. And we walk across the yard again back into the main penitentiary. And the whole time Bob's talking, talking, talking. And I can't pay attention. You know, it's my first time to ever see a prison be inside. He's talking and I'm just kind of looking. You walk in and when you come in, Bob, is it not hot? Is it not dark? Is it dirty? It's dirty. Is it depressing? Depends on what it's there for. <laughs> you get there for 20 years, it's depressing. It's, trust me. Come find out one of my favorite movies uh, is Gator. Burt Reynolds, John Remember that old 70s movie, Gator. Come find out my mom and daddy went and seen that at the drive-in for their honeymoon. And I've always really liked that movie. That movie was filmed in Tucker. If you'll, at the very beginning when he's in prison and he finds out his brother's been killed, they shot him sitting on the bed. I would be willing to bet you a steak dinner that we was probably in one of the barracks that he was in in there. So anyhow, you walk down this big hallway and Bob's like, there's a, there, there's a barracks, there's a barracks, there's a barracks, and, and, and I'm like, okay, there's a barracks, but where's this little room where we get this one-on-one -on -one deal with? And like, no, that's intake. We're just going into the barracks. Barracks is probably 30, 40 foot wide, 100 foot long. How many do they have? 80? 100. 100, 100 to each one. 100 to each one. So I mean, and you can tell that they're probably over, overstocked because there's a row of beds down one side, a row of beds down the other, which way it kind of looks like it's supposed to be, but then they got another row turned long ways right down the middle. And in the very back is about a four-foot concrete block wall. It's, only, uh, it's the only thing that separates you from the bathroom. On the other side is the toilets, the shower, and the sink. So if you got a room or if you got a bed back there on that back wall, that means you're this far from somebody sitting on the toilet. So, all right, so here we are. And he said, no, we're going in the barracks. And I'm like, really? You know, there's some anxiousness to me, right? And we're looking at dudes walking around with them pantyhose on their head, and no shirts on. They sure ain't <laughs> built like me. These dudes have been doing that penitentiary workout, right? You know, their muscles up for the tough. Old boys in there with tattoos covered from here to here. You know, the whole face is tattooed. It, it's not what you see every day in Hector Arkansas. Let me put it like that. It's, it's a rough environment. You can tell that. It's hot, stinky, nasty, rough environment. So we're standing there in front of these prison, these cell bars. These four men that I describe to you physically that are not physically impressive men. In that instance, when I stood there and seen them stand right here, say the prison, the, the, the bars are right here. I seen them stand, toe on the line, waiting for that prison guard to open themselves. And they look like gladiators. In that instance, I've never, y'all ever seen a football team stand in the tunnel, ever been part of a football team that stands in the tunnel? You know how the music's going and you're all hyped and you, if any of you have ever been through it, you're about to run, we used to not have tunnels, we used to just have the big banners, but you can't stand still. I watched Bob and these three other fellers, they couldn't stand still, they was ready. I think one of them told the prison guard, let's go. Or, yeah, I can't remember for sure. But 
I seen these four average looking fellas that fast turn into these warriors. They were men on mission. Y'all ever seen Russell Crowe Russell Clo in that movie Gladiator? You know, when he's behind the bars and he's getting used to all these fights out in the rain. <clears throat> and he had this persona about that's the way these men had to it. All right, but now one thing that they, they made sure that they, they knew, they knew who the enemy was. They were ready for war. They were ready for battle. They had on the full armor of God. And they knew who the enemy was. And guess who the enemy in there was not? The enemy is not the prisoners. The enemy is Satan. The prisoners are the mission field. And they went to that battlefield and they fought Satan. And they fought Satan. Bob told me, he said, hey man, hang on. Hang on by me if you want. He said, kindly watch how it's done. This is your first time. So I said, all right, I will. I mean, I with him once, you know, and, and what we did was we walked through with handfuls of Bibles, saying, you want a Bible, you want a Bible, you want a Bible. And anybody that said yes, that gave you the opportunity to, to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus with them. And so I watched him, and I listened to him share the gospel with a guy, you know, and I was like, well, no offense, Bob, but I was like, I know the gospel. I'm a recipient of the gospel, so I don't, I, so I stand there listening to him, and I seen two or three dudes just kept kind of staring at me, you know, kind of like, hey, I want a Bible. At least that's what you hope they're staring at you for. You know, so I seen the opportunity. I said, okay, I think I've got this. So I went to them. Bible, Bible, you know, what you know about Jesus, what you know. So we got the opportunity to share the gospel with, I don't know, I think we handed out 100 Bibles that day, somewhere close to it. Got to share the gospel so many. Had a great line while I was in there, and I felt like the Lord gave it to me. There's a fellow Bob was talking to had a tattoo on there that said, only God can judge me. Have y'all ever noticed that people who say only God can judge me live like, usually live like God's never going to judge them? Have y'all ever noticed that? That's the truth. But I seen that and I was like, you know what? God is going to judge you. God's going to judge me. And so I tell everybody in there, I said, uh, I said, you found yourself in here. And trust me, I was not concerned with why they were in there. Not concerned with what they did. I did not concern if they were guilty or innocent. I was concerned with one thing in there, and that was sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I would tell each and every one of them, if you found yourself in here, I said, you're undoubtedly familiar with the court system, right? And they'd all say, oh, yeah, yeah, we know how the court system works. I said, well, here's the deal. We've all got one more court date. We have one more court date. I said, and it's when we leave this world. You have a court date, I have a court date, and guess what? Every one of y'all in here has a court date. And that's with the most almighty, high, just judge there ever was, ever will be. It's God Almighty, the Father, is going to judge us. He's going to find sin in our lives. You know what the penalty for sin is? Hell. That is the penalty for hell. So, I would tell all of them, you have a choice to make. You have one of two choices to make. You can either pay that penalty like you're paying the penalty that you're in right now in these prison bars. You can either pay that penalty and spend eternity in hell for your sins or you can put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and put your sins upon him that he's already paid 2,000 years ago. It's your choice. It's that simple. We had some, our response in there, I believe, was probably about the same response that you get out in the world, or at least that was my experience, Bob. Most people didn't seem too awful interested. Some people seemed somewhat interested, and, and a few of those people showed a lot of interest. Was it jailhouse religion? Possibly. Could have been the work of the Holy Spirit really working on somebody. That's not my job to decide. My job is to go and sow seeds. All right, that's up to God to, to figure out if they're looking for jailhouse religion or, or whatever. That's my job. So my question is to y'all, prison ministry might not be your ministry, but this is my question to the church, God's chosen people. What are y'all doing? Is there a warrior in here? Are you an average-looking person? Nothing great about you 
physically and stuff, but you can transform into a warrior. See, one thing that I learned so much that day was that the vast majority of the church does not live the Christian life that Jesus called us to live. We think living the Christian life means we make it through work without cussing somebody out. We remember to pray over our meal once in a while, most of the time, you know. Uh, if something comes on TV, it's a little too vulgar, we turn it off. Then on Sunday mornings, we go to church and we get some goosebumps, we hear a good sermon, we dress up. Buddy, we're living the Christian life, right? Ain't that what most people's opinions are? Oh, that is so far from the truth that, that it, it, it's sickening how we actually live as to what Christ called us to do. Christ gave us seven things in the body of armor. We don't use it. We don't use it at all. I see so many of us, and I, I'm speaking to myself here. I've been this, I've been so guilty. Uh, and, and, you know, I've even prayed. Oh, God, don't let this happen. Don't let that happen. Don't let this happen. You know, and I'm worried about the attacks coming in from the devil. Folks, I watched four average-looking men go in and not worry about the attacks from the devil. They had on the full armor of Christ. There's a reason why five of those armor, there's seven pieces, if I'm not mistaken. There's seven pieces of armor. Five of them is for defense. Guess what that means? Expect things to come from the devil. Now, you can do one of two things about it. You can either hide in your little hidey hole and be like, well, me and my four and no more as long as we're good, life's good, let's stay in this foxhole and, and pray that the devil don't attack us and God, he'll take care of Or you can do like Jesus called us to do and take the fight to the enemy. How many of y'all in here Christians are actually fighting? How many of y'all are actually going to battle? How many of y'all are out there actually trying to win souls for, the, for Christ, for the kingdom? I myself have found myself so slack in that area. I have to repent of it. And I have to say, by God's grace and God's gift and God's mercy, I'm, I'm not living like that anymore. I need to be so much more for Christ than what I am. So you think you can't, does anybody here think they can't do it? They're like, well, I'm not really a fighter. Uh, I, it's just not, I like my glasses. Uh, I'm not really a fighter. You know, I don't like conflict. I don't like this. I don't like that. And guess what? If you think you can't do it, that is perfect. That is the exact attitude to have because when you know you can't do it, you know you've got Christ who can do it through you. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through, 8 through 10 says, My grace is sufficient. My power works best in your weakness. Now, this is God talking. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weakness, for when I am weak is when I am strong. What that's saying is it's not me to go to the penitentiary and, and, and share the gospel. That's not something that I would just normally say, yep, here I am, let's, let's go. No, that's out of my comfort zone. But when I went down there, I knew, hey, God, this is going to have to be you, not me. Does that make sense? All right, so that's not enough scripture for you. What about Philippians 4, 13? Everybody knows that one. I can do, does it say I can do some things through Christ? It says all things. It don't say I can do what I want to do through Christ. It doesn't say I can do this or that. But no, Philippians 4, 4, 13 says I can do all things through Christ. You want to be a warrior, but you don't think you can? Philippians 4.13 says, Through Christ you can be a warrior for the kingdom of God. Deuteronomy 31.6 says, So be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. This is God talking. And do not panic before them, for the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. Does, does that need translation for anybody? That's pretty plain spoken. I said, he'll go before me. Prepare for me. Guess what? I don't know how many people for sure that we led to Christ that day, but we had one man profess his faith in the Lord that day and gave his heart to Christ that day. I'm going to assume that Deuteronomy 31.6 told us that Christ done went down there for us, was preparing his heart. He knew we was coming. And while we was down there, he was there with us. Does anybody else have a different translation of that? Because that's how I take it. What about Matthew 28, 20? It says, and be sure of this, 
I am with you always to the end of age. Folks, it's easy to fight a battle when you know the victory is already with you. It's kind of like, I didn't have a big brother. I had some pretty mean cousins. And uh, talking about getting fist fights when you was younger and your blood gets pumped and stuff, you know, there were some dudes that you wanted to fight and there were some dudes you didn't want to fight. And I'm talking about some little old kid boy stuff. You know, what we do when we're children. There are some that, you, yeah, I fight. You, you always knew who you want to fight, but you also knew who you didn't want to fight. But when you had, if you had a big brother or a cousin or a buddy that was tough, you did not fight anybody because you know it was going to be on the up and up, right? It's like God being with you. I ain't going to fight with anybody. And I'm not sitting there telling you, I just look forward to it sometimes, all the time. Hey, look, I'm, I ain't finished yet. Uh, but when Christ is with you, who can be against you, right? You got the balls on your side, right? And that's a terrible translation for God, but I put it in a way that y'all understand. Right. So, that was for the church for the most part. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to challenge y'all. I'm going to challenge y'all. Get that warrior spirit. It's not, it just, it's not in us. It's not in our flesh. It's in our flesh to be warriors for other things, right? But is it in our flesh? Is it in us naturally to be warriors for Christ? Absolutely not. So where does that strength come from? It comes from the Father, right? It comes from the Holy Spirit. It comes from a triune God. I challenge each and every one of y'all to get that. Navy SEAL boots on the ground, soldiers ready to fight the devil wherever, whenever, however. Know that, that bat, know that the battle may have to be fought, but the war is already won, and it was won 2,000 years ago. It's easy to fight a battle, but you know it's, it's won. You know, it's like going back and playing a football game that you've already won. You know, you know what it is. All right, so, I'm sad to say this, but a lot of the church does not know how to share the gospel. Y'all ever notice that? <laughs> I was this way for a long time, and I'm, I'm afraid that probably some of y'all one thing I've noticed about people is we're all basically the same. And if I if I've dealt with certain things, chances are y'all dealt with certain things. Y'all are dealing with it as well. Um, for a long time, you know how I witnessed to, po to folks. Hey man, uh, you go to church anywhere? Uh, we'd like to have you come to church. You know, you don't. That was the way I witnessed to folks. You know, but my whole deal was, hey, if I just get in church, then my pastor can tell them about Jesus and the good news of the gospel, and they'll get saved. Jesus be so proud of me. Does the Great Commission say, there, uh, go forth, therefore go ye into all nations and invite them to your church? No. Now, if that's where you are right now with your walk with Christ, hey, I was there. I understand. I also understand sanctification is a process. Some people process a little faster than others, but I'm just here to tell you, you might not always be able to invite people to church. You might not have time to, they might not have time for you to invite them to church. You need to learn how to share the gospel. So you might ask, how do I share the gospel? I'm proud you did. Did you know that the entire Bible points to the gospel of Christ? Most people think the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? That's what's called the Gospels. Did you know the entire Bible points to the Gospel of Jesus Christ? The very first time I can, I know of it taking place in the Bible is in the Old Testament, way, 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 way back after Adam and Eve committed their first sin. Once they committed their first sin and they ate of the forbidden fruit, and they knew that they had disobeyed God, what the first thing they did? They went and hid themselves. They were naked. They hid themselves. And they tried covering themselves with fig leaves. What does that mean they were doing? They were trying to cover up their own sin. Right? They were saying, okay, we'll fix us. Guess what? Most of the world today is still saying, we'll fix us. What did it take? It took the Lord Almighty to fix them. How did he fix them? Here's the first prophetic. Here's the first foreshadowing of a Christ to come. And God killed an animal. 
there is your sacrifice. And what he do with that animal? Since they were naked, he covered them. He made them clothes, and they were covered. There is your first foreshadow of Christ to come. That's your first time in the Bible you hear. Because of the first sin, we didn't need Christ before sin, but since sin comes, we need Christ. I've heard people say, we need Christ more today than we ever have. False. Although I like the zealousness and stuff, that's not true. We've needed Christ just as bad after the very first sin as we need him today. He's never been any more needed, any less needed. He's always just been fully needed. All right, so there's the first thing that shares the gospel with us. It's cool. Once you understand that Christ is evident throughout the entire Bible, you can break it down into three parts. The Old Testament is Christ is coming. Jesus is coming. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is Jesus is here. Then Acts, the Revelation, the rest of the Bible is Jesus is coming back. So, but once you figure out that God is, Jesus is present throughout the Old Testament, it gets a very interesting way in how to read the Old Testament is trying to find a Christ or a Christ foreshadow in the Old Testament. Here's just some quick ones off the top of my head that when I was writing this down. Uh, the Ark of, uh, you know, Noah built an ark. Did you all know that ark is a foreshadow? That boat is a foreshadow of Christ. The world is doomed. The only way to get saved for the righteous, which was Noah and his family, was to get on the ark. All that is is representation that you are doomed unless you get on that ark, and that ark is Christ. Another way is Boaz to Ruth. If you all not familiar with the book of Ruth, Boaz was known as Ruth's Redeemer. She had found herself in a terrible place, her and her mother-in-law. Guess who redeemed her? A man named Boaz took, took her in, took care of her, married her. What does Christ do with the church? He marries the church. Boaz is a representation of Christ. So for you church folks, for you saved folks that understand somewhat, I challenge you to read the Bible and find Christ throughout every story that's in the Bible. Um, Moses. Moses was a pre-Christ, a foreshadow of Christ. He was the mediator. It means God talked to him and he talked to the people, and the people talked to him and he talked to God. Guess what Christ does? How do we get to Christ or how do we get to God these days? Through Jesus Christ. So you see there's representations of the whole Bible points. To the gospel of Christ. So if you don't know how to uh, share the gospel, just share the Bible. Share what you know. Now those are those are some kind of maybe those are for more maybe a little more of the advanced, uh, you know, somebody that you can speak with. But what about the bluntness? I'm a blunt guy, right? I talk bluntly, and I want to be spoken bluntly, bluntly too. So how, how do I share the gospel? Well, you need to know your Bible, at least. The gospel part of it, right? So how do I share the gospel with folks? There's a thing called Romans Road. If you need to know all the scriptures, holler at me. I'll give them to you. That's just the easiest way to know the Roman Road. Google it. Google Roman Road. All the scriptures pop up. All right, the Roman Road is a very short deal, but this is enough scripture right here. The whole Bible points to Christ, but these one, two, three, four, these five scriptures show a person. That they are lost and headed for hell, that they need Jesus, that Jesus came. Five scriptures. That's, starting out, that's all. There's five million scriptures in this Bible that point to Christ. But these right here, five. All you need to know, remember, Roman Road. Look it up, Google it, however you need to do it. Roman Road. All right, the very first one, Roman Road, is 310. It says, as the scriptures say, no one is righteous. Not even one. That means, guess what? When you're talking to somebody and they say, well, I think I'm good enough to get into heaven. Most most religions teach that uh, you get put on a, a, a balance, a scales balance, right? The good, if the good outweighs the bad, you go to heaven. And if the bad outweighs the good, you go to hell. That's religion. That's not truth. That's not the gospel. The truth of the matter is everybody is born with a death certificate, with a death sentence. Everybody's headed for hell. We're sinful people. We can't help it. That's, to be honest with you, I don't really think it's fair that we're born that way, but guess what? I'm not God. I don't get to choose what's fair, what's not fair. I don't get to say. All I can tell you is what the Scripture says. We are born, headed for hell. At a certain point, we come to our life, we understand that there is a God, and we are to serve Him. If we don't make that choice, we are headed for hell. So, as the Scripture says, no one is righteous. 
not even one. In Romans 3.23, it says, For everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of the God's glorious standard. That's just a repeat of the first. We've all, we've all sinned. God's standard to get into heaven is perfection. That's the only way you can get into heaven without Jesus is to be perfect. Is anybody in here still perfect? Not at all. Okay, the next one, Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. What's that mean? That means your sin, breaking God's law, has cost you eternity. It means you are headed for hell. That's the bad news I have to share with the world today. You are headed for hell. Here's the good news. There's a bad side, a good side. But the free gift of God's eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. That means you are headed for hell, but if you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are headed for heaven. Okay, now let's go back to Romans 5, 8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were sinners. What, you mean Christ died for me while I was a sinner? Yes, he did. Romans 10, 13. For everyone. Raise your hand in here if you're an everyone. Everybody is an everyone. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Calls on the name of the Lord. What is the name of the Lord? Is it Buddha? Is it Muhammad? Allah, whatever. I don't know all that's for about. No, his name is Jesus Christ. If you call upon the name of Jesus Christ and you repent of your sins, see, everybody wants a Savior. Not everybody wants a Lord, but it don't work that way. If you profess him as Lord, he will be your Savior. What do I mean, profess him as Lord? That means who you see up here is no longer me. Christ lives in me and through me, and I'm at his mercy. Whatever he tells me to do, I tried my best to be obedient and do it. When we went to prison the other day, me and Jess was down camping. I was catfishing. Do you think Richard, the guy you're looking at right now, would really want to leave vacation and, and fish camp and have a good time to go to a hot, stinky, nasty prison? My flesh said no. But Jesus said yes. And my will to please Jesus overrides my flesh. So when you make him Lord, he becomes your Savior. Now everybody wants a Savior, not everybody wants a Lord. Y'all know the story of uh, Jesus on the crucifixion. There was three crosses. He was in the middle. There was a, a thief on the right and a thief on the left. I believe they were both thieves. I'm not sure on that. But one man said, hey, if you're really the Son of God, won't you just get us down? See, he was looking for a Savior. He was not looking for a Lord. I promise you, if, he, if God would have got him off, he would have went back to doing the exact same life that got him back up there. Man, I believe, was on his left. I'm not sure about that, but the other man, he said, uh uh, you're a fool. Can't you see that this is truly God? This is the Son of God. And this man said, no matter what the circumstance, it looks like I'm going to die. And even if he don't get me down, even if he doesn't save my fleshly body, he is still God, and I'm serving him for the last few minutes of my life. See, one man got a, got a Lord and a Savior. The other man that just wanted to save him. You know, he, got, he got hell for eternity. Now that right there was the first part, and the second part's not going to take long. I've never been much on a long church service myself. This right here is for the folks who do not profess to know Jesus. It's for the folks who have not, in church terms, been saved. I started to write down what the gospel is exactly. And we could have went through it. I basically went through the gospel in the Romans Road. But I started to write it in my own words. But there's a man named Dr. Steve Lawson who shared the gospel on YouTube. And I encourage all of y'all to look it up. I'll show you where to find it and listen to him share the gospel. What he did was he took lots of scriptures and put it in his own words so eloquent. He spoke so much more eloquent and fulfilling than what I can. So what I did earlier today was as he spoke, I sat there and wrote down everything he said. So this is the words of Dr. Steve Lawson. And I promise you, if you're saved, listen to this. It'll strengthen you. This will help put that warrior mentality in your heart. If you are not saved, I beg, plead. I don't know what else I can do. I 
begging to listen to this. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Let this sink in. This is Dr. Steve Lawson speaking. He said, the gospel is very simply Jesus Christ. He is the Son of God, the Son of a man, sent into this world, born of a virgin, that he might be sinless, that he might be born under the law, that he might keep the law that you and I break day after day. The perfect, sinless Son of God has perfectly met all the requirements of God's law and is ready to give his righteousness, righteousness to us that we would have a perfect standing before God. That he went to a cross. There he was lifted up to die. There upon that cross the sins of everyone that would believe on him were transferred to him and him that knew no sin God made to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. The great exchange of the cross. The worst of me laid upon him and the best of him was laid upon me as he shed his blood upon that cross. He reconciled sinful man to a holy God. There is no other way for us to have a relationship with a holy God except through the blood of the cross, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's by his sin, and it's by his sin uh, bearing substitutionary vicarious death upon that cross, it was as if he took his sinful man in one hand and a holy God in another hand, and he brought the two together through his death. That by that death, he satisfied the righteous anger of God and appeased his wrath towards all who would believe in him. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, being justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It was through that death that he redeemed sinners out of the slave market of sin and redeemed us out of the tyranny of Satan's grip upon our lives. It was by that death that Jesus now has provided salvation free for all who will call upon his name. He was taken down from that cross. He said it is finished. Not I am finished, but it is finished. He had completed the mission of salvation that he had come into this world to accomplish. He was buried in a rich man's tomb, and on the third day, by all the power that was inherit, inherit, inherit within him as the Son of God, he raised himself from the dead. He came walking out of that tomb, a risen, living, victorious Savior. He ascended back to heaven. He was now seated at the right hand of the Father, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He is mighty to save unto the uttermost all who call upon him. To call upon the Lord Jesus Christ is to look away from yourself, to look away from religion, to look away from your church, to look away from your denomination, to look away from your baptism and church membership, and to look away from all your good works and look exclusively upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, him that would come to me, I would in no, no way cast out. He loves to save sinners. He's a friend of the sinner. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. He came not for the righteousness, for the righteous, but he came for the unrighteous. He is a good physician. He came not for those who are well, but for those who are sick. I ask you, sinner, will you tell him right now how spiritually sick you are? That you cannot save yourself. Would you call upon him and say, Lord Jesus, save me? I'm a wretched, hell-bound sinner. But your grace is being offered to sinners like me. If you do, your sins will be washed away. If you will call upon him, he will give you his righteousness. It is a free gift. There is nothing you can do to earn it. Jesus will clothe you in his perfect righteousness. And as God looks upon you, he will see only the righteousness of Jesus. And one day when you die, Jesus will take you into the presence of an almighty God, the Father, and presume your faultless, present you faultless before the throne of God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes before the Father but through me. Peter said, there is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. If you refuse to accept the gospel, your blood is on your own hands, and you will suffer in hell forever, <laughs> ever of the torment of the wrath of God. And you will never find relief for your soul. But today, sinners, is the day of salvation. I've cried because I love each and every one of you. If you come to me, 
Can you tell me you're quitting, huh? To be honest with you, I don't really care. If you tell me that you're not ever going to fish, I don't really care. And if you tell me that you don't like me, I don't care. But please don't tell me you reject Jesus Christ as your Savior. There's not a person in this world I want to see go to hell. I ask you, if you don't know Christ, please, please, please don't. You know what, I have made you all along, but this is a personal work of the Holy Spirit. And if he is speaking to you, do not wait another day. Thank you for listening to this. And I thank God and tell me for opening this up for me. If you can hear me, just, just know, if you hear my voice, know that I love you. And most of all, Jesus loves you. And he died for you.